We are great, powerful, and mighty spiritual beings with dignity, direction, and purpose. Never forget that because that's who you are. And when you look at it, there's only one thing that can ever go wrong. You allow something to skew your direction, which will affect your dignity and your purpose. And so what is that one thing that's skewing your direction? Welcome, everybody. I'm so excited to be here with you and so excited to have a very special guest with us today, Daniel Brinkley. And we are addressing the star seeds and the star beings. And we're going to talk about an expanded view of ourselves and reality and what this means for the navigation of our eternal soul's timeline, and also how you can navigate the ever-changing tides that we are a part of right now in a blessed and empowered way. We have a very exciting program for you today. And if you stay to the very end, um, I'm going to have a giveaway of these wonderful um, handmade wooden cars for children. Um, these are made from recycled wood and it's all a volunteer basis. And a lot of veterans work with this company too. It's called the Happy Factory in Utah. And I got a box full of these cars and they, they're meant to go to children in need. And so um, these are the first two that are being um, sent off into the world from this big box that I have, and I'm looking to find children in need who would be very happy to have these. So um, they're oiled with mineral oil, and I was with my mother um, back in Utah oiling these cars. So at the very end, we will do a pop quiz. So listen well, because it will be a quiz on something that we're talking about today. So I would like to introduce Danyan, but before I do that, for those of you that don't know who I am, my name's Elizabeth Seraphine. I just chose my last name about a year ago, so I chose an angelic last name. Um, so some of you may know me as Elizabeth Wilcock. Um, so I'm the creator of the Priestess Path Lineages of Light Mystery School. And in that mystery school, I initiate women into the sacred arts. And I have been studying with masters and grandmasters in the ancient lineages for 35 years now. And also when we do the Wudong and the Tai Chi programs, men are involved. And then sometimes I do free webinars like this, um, where everybody is invited. Today, we have a very special guest, Daniel Brinkley. Daniel Brinkley is a luminary in the spiritual field. He put the near-death experience on the map. He's the author of the best-selling book, Saved by the Light, which has sold 22 million copies worldwide. He is a speaker. He is a near-death experiencer. He is also a veteran, and he's he was a Marine, and he started the largest palliative care organization for veterans called the Twilight Brigade so that no veteran dies alone. And he has been with 357 people as they have taken their last breath. And he has sat at the bedside of over 2000 people who were making their transition to the other side. So without further ado, Daniel, uh, welcome. Oh, thank you so very much, Elizabeth. It's a pleasure to be here as you are doing these programs. So one of the main things we're dealing with now, and Daniel, and I'd like to get your view on this, the changes that we are all going through on this planet and individually, the changes in consciousness, the changes in our worldview and the changes in our practical lives. Can you give a little overview of the state of the world, Daniel? Well, I think that the state of the world, Elizabeth, is exactly where it's supposed to be when you're participating in the birth 
of a new era, a new age. If you look at it from the Mayan point of view, the Mayan calendar ended and began again uh, December, the tw- uh, December the 21st, 2012. So that would mean we'd be in the 13th year of the a new age. What they said was all things done not in integrity would collapse. And we are watching it achieve that goal. And the other thing they said that in the future of this next era, there would be no, there would not be any hidden knowledge. Everything would be known. And we know now everything is recorded. Everything is locked into place. So people have to understand that the energetic pattern of what happens as this age is changing, we're witnessing in every level, Elizabeth, that we know from our root chakra to our crown chakra, okay? And as I have watched what we call the boxes of knowledge given to me by those 13 beings in the first near-death experience in 1975, we are birthing an age And those of us who look at this information are identifying a part that's inside of us, star children, star power. We're all part of a bigger, deeper, more vast uh, area than we ever realize we are. And that we are the difference that the divine makes in this eternal shift. And there has to be a balance and a way to look at that so you get the most out of it as you achieve your spiritual goal. So where we are is watching a whole new age being birthed. Where is the power according to the Maya? The Maya believe that it's the power of the feminine, usually the first 52 to 58 years. There's a lot of people who argue with me about that, but I get it from years and years and years, Elizabeth, of paying attention to the Maya over 55 years. So the feminine power, is the most powerful now in the birthing of an age. And here's where we are. So every person that's a female that's participating, it's your time. It's your time to be the very best that you could be, to choose what you will do and why you will do it, and understand that that power, those feminine natures and insights, is the power that will help guide all of the rest of us forward. Thank you, Danyan. And yes, I'm sure you can feel it in the cosmos. I say that the call of the goddess is resounding through the cosmos and we are listening. Um, When I was really young, age 14, I, I wanted to be trained by a mature woman about the secrets of the cosmos, the secrets of healing, the secrets of my body. And Um, there were no wise women that I could find or turn to at that age. I really wanted to um, enter a temple. I wanted to live temple life. I was always very attuned to God and the sacred. I could see spirits. And so at that age for me, it was really depressing that I could not access the information that I knew that I needed and wanted And so that really like planted the seed for what I do now, because there was a really long journey between 14 and now many, many things happened, um, many initiations, many heartbreaks, many illnesses, and all of those led me to sacred knowledge. And it led me to studying ancient lineages and working with masters and grandmasters and piecing together the sacred feminine information that was not easy to find and wasn't codified. And so now, of course, you can see there is a movement for women. And so that's why I established the Priestess Path Lineages of Light, because I am part of reestablishing that sacred role for women. Priestess is what it was called in the West shamaness, medicine woman, crone, healer, and also in helping to reestablish for women 
of all ages, our initiations, and also honoring the crone time, that time when women have so much wisdom to share. And so that's that's the path that I went on. And it's interesting, Danian, that you talk a lot about the Mayan calendar, and you mentioned that we're in this 52-year cycle that uh, where the feminine is rising. Can you talk a little bit more about the Mayan calendar? What happened in 2012? What does that mean for us and how we can incorporate this feminine in our lives? See, what I'm trying to do, Elizabeth, is we have to create new timelines. This is what has to happen. And we have to create a new way to look at where we are so we clearly see what it is and how we use the rise of the change in power, nature, and energetics to our advantage as spiritual beings. So as this is unfolding, why I use the Maya, I mean, there are 25 other cultures that I understand, but the Maya is two hours from Houston. You know, if you don't think what I'm saying is true, two hours from Houston, you can go find out if it's true or not. Okay. And it means that it isn't some far off in India. It's just down in Mexico. And so by looking at how the Mayan calendar is structured and looking at the timelines and what the Maya knew that it was 25,920 years, we say 26,000 years for the procession of the equinox. That means our solar system moves through a series of zodiac signs called the procession of the equinox. Everybody knows that. But the Mayans knew it first. The Mayans invented the zero 800 years before anybody who were the Moors who conquered, conquered southern Spain and southern Europe brought the zero. But it was 800 to 1,000 years later. So they probably, somebody came to Maya land and got the zero so that you had, so the nature of multiplication can become, can evolve. So when you look at it from that point, Elizabeth, it's not a far stretch to realize you have a timeline that you can look at that helps you ground yourself in the nature of your spirituality. Why well, I said a lot of people don't agree with me about it being the power of the feminine, they don't realize that the feminine's power is always there. But the matriarchal power takes about 50 years to figure out some rules and laws that makes it illegal to be feminine. <laughs> you know, we have all that stuff and that's what happens. So why these these people who are studying the calendar say, hey, the first 58 years, 52 to 58 years, the feminine power cannot be overpowered by the nature of the masculine power as it structures being the provider as a psychologist. Okay, so when I look at the Maya, it's easy for me to know I have watched the future for 48 years. And I wrote about all of this and uh, in 1976, and I put it in Saved by the Light. And we're now in the final box of the 50-year plan that I saw, which ends in 225. Of that 50-year plan, I'm in the final five or six moments of watching it unfold, the final vision. So not only have I witnessed the transformation and participated in the transformation, I can also consciously and with a true sincere tell people, hey, everybody, that energy's moving. And the deeper you breathe, and the more as you are feminine power, to pay attention to yourself as a woman, what you feel, what you think, what you hope for, what you're thoughtful of, and to think about that as a strength and a power, because that's what allows the feminine to raise its frequency to a little higher octave and perceive your place in where you are. I know that sounds a little cosmic, but it's still how it works. It's important to note that as the feminine energy is coming back onto the planet as it is, that it's in honor of the divine sacred masculine. Um, it's, you know, I'm not a feminist in that particular way. I mean, I was raised for 30 years by 
masters and grandmasters in the martial arts and trained in the sacred warrior lineages. So a huge part of who I am and the codes that I carry are from the sacred masculine. And so um, it's, it's time for both of us. And really, even as the feminine energies are streaming into the planet, it informs the masculine as well. And in the martial art lineages, what we're taught is that the masculine stands in protection, stands strongly, you know, boldly in protection of the sacred. And that's the earth, the animals, the feminine, the elderly, the children, and holds that perimeter so that innocence and the children's fire, which is the innocence inside all of us and children can flourish unimpeded. But in order for that to happen, inferior energies actually have to be protected against. It just happens to be a fact of this world that there are what are called inferior energies. Um, I take that from the I Ching. And energies that would harm uh, people that would harm and because in order to uh, protect the temples and protect the sacred uh, spaces, people sometimes have to stand up and be warriors. And so that's how I see the the sacred masculine. So the feminine needs that masculine. And so it's it's all inclusive. For men also, it is it's the um, opportunity to incorporate that feminine energy inside of one's being and to stand in protection of it. And so, of course, we both have masculine and feminine inside of us. Um, oh, so- I, am a, I am a devout feminist. OK, <laughs> I am a devout feminist. I think that women should rule the whole world. They do a better job than most men. And I think that women are smarter, kinder, and more aware of what's really needed in situations than those of us who think we know everything and we're always right. I mean, I I don't have a problem. uh, You know, I don't have a problem of looking at the feminine from watching children grow up around me, most of the girls growing up and watching how each grew and changed and developed over watching for 20 years, 23 years, to understand that this is the feminine's time. This is your time. To waste a single minute not believing what I'm telling you is a mistake. And to make a plan to achieve whatever goal, you have to look at it from two things. This is like what Elizabeth's saying. There is the masculine and the feminine, the yin and the yang. It's all about power and balance. Most people never understand. You have a positive and a negative, but where is the divine? The divine is in the neutral, okay? Proton, electron, and neutron. The neutron is where the power is. The feminine holds that sacred level of consciousness within this dimension. It is the feminine that holds the potential for creativity within this dimension, end of story. So by taking this this change in season and the birth of the fall and realizing it's historically proven there are calendars that knew there were 365 days in the calendar when we, most of us was picking berries and wearing sheepskins and eating rabbits and bark. Okay, so they knew the calendar, they knew the procession, they knew where things were, and they dimensionally operated on five simultaneous levels or perspectives of themselves as spiritual beings in human form. This is the basis of how the Maya looked at the world they lived in and still functioned in it as everyday native people, uh, First Nation, star children they, everybody came from somewhere we we somehow got away from the fact that we are star children where every other nation and first nations every other first nation got a got a story about where they were from and what the star people looked like and what kind of ships they were in 
what they were talking about, what they brought. We got a story about somebody bringing some fire, okay, and a snake talking about eating from an apple. I mean, listen to what we have as stories as opposed to what Native nations has as stories. And those stories are old. And the Maya, I absolutely love them. And the the thing that makes you really stop and, and think about it is there's a place, Palenque in, in uh, Yucatan. And there's a place in India near Kashmir that they are identically constructed. They're identically constructed, and the Indian, they speak an ancient Mayan dialect, an ancient Mayan dialect. So all of a sudden, in a brief moment about the value of that we're in a new age, there is a historical place that the history of that nation and those people that opens up Lumeria, the Mu, the whole consciousness of ancient technologies and ancient spiritual forces and energetics and knowledge of the transition of ages. It opens that up. And so I've only been studying the Maya for 55 years. I've studied the Maya more than I've been entertained by death. And I've mm-hmm. certainly been entertained by death. <laughs> right. So, you know, what's interesting is we had the book burnings in the, the Western world, if you will. So there were times when all of the records were burned and um, then only the Bible was available and the Bible was highly edited. So there was a great forgetting and a programming. And also it's through that lineage of the Western, um, the Western lineage that they put an end to the priestesses, uh, the temples of the goddesses and any woman who had a station in society that was of a sacred role. And so that's why in the West, we are rebuilding and resurrecting these sacred roles uh, for women. But in a lot of the ancient societies, there are still the stories of um, them being from the stars. And if we look at our very oldest cuneiform texts, it says exactly that, that we are genetically engineered. We're a mixture between um, star people's DNA and the DNA of a hominid on this planet, except oddly for our negative people, which I am. So they can't trace that to a hominid, which is very interesting. But, um, you know, let's let's talk about death. <laughs> because yeah. Death is one of those um, really fun on Sunday afternoon. (laughs) Let's talk about death on a Sunday afternoon. But I love what you say, Daniel. You're like, there is no death. Never happens. Death never happens. Let's start with that, that death never happens. And you know what? There's probably there's probably no one on this planet more qualified than you, Daniel to talk about this. And so death is um, so scary for so many people. And there's been a lot of it lately too. Um, A lot of loved ones have died and are going to continue. So this is a fact of all all our lives. So Danya, can you share um, why you feel there is no death? Well, I've been dead so many times. It's like a comedy routine. If you want to know what PTSD is, go ask my brother and sister how many times they've come to the bedside because the doctors have to tell to tell me goodbye. Okay, that you know it's that time, it's over. Well, being struck by lightning, open heart surgery, brain surgery, open heart surgery, resuscitation all not that I didn't take care of myself, it was because of being struck by lightning. I have been dead and I have seen the other side four times. I have seen what it's like to come back as a spiritual being to enter a physical body and to occupy that body dead one time and then near death experiences and open heart surgery and then brain surgery and then another open heart surgery and then have to be resuscitated twice. So that's three times being dead and three times of near death experiences. Okay. So when you stop and you look at it from those points of view and you compare those two, come across something that grounds everything, Elizabeth. And where people make their biggest mistake about growing up and living in reality. 
people who come back have something called the panoramic life review. That means they see their life pass before them. For me, I saw my life pass before me in a 360 degree panorama. I watch it from a second person point of view as though I was my own best friend. So how stupid I was or how silly I was, wasn't near as important as me facing myself. And then I literally became every person that I'd ever encountered. And I felt the direct results of my interaction between me and each of those people. By the, the first near death experience was terrible because I was not the nicest person or the most heart centered person. You know, I was not played sports all my life, was a fighter, was in the Marine Corps and many other various and sundry events. But I wasn't there in the in the sequencing of these experiences. I learned a lot about what the near death experience is, but the conclusion that everybody should think about, let's say if it's a Christian point of view, everybody should think about between now and when Jesus is supposed to come back, what are you supposed to do? Okay, until he returns to save us from ourselves. And so at the end of a life review, the question that literally I asked myself was if God hadn't come, God couldn't come today. And God had sent me in the life I just reviewed, then what difference did me and God make? Well, we didn't make much difference. So I don't I don't know whether you call it the change or repent or how people structure it. But when you realize that you are a spiritual being, and that's what you are, and you got nowhere to go. And when I was a spiritual being the most, they said I was dead. Okay. That's what they said, all right? And so for that 28 minutes, I got a chance to experience both the future, an undeniable ability to have to accept the fact that I am a spiritual being. That means I am not going to die. And that means that life as you know it and the way you've been taught religiously and institutionally and ceremonially, all that is nonsense. Nonsense. Nobody ever dies. And when you look at it from me, why? If God couldn't come today and God had sent me, and in the life I just reviewed, what difference had me and God made? So I decided based on that, that I would become a hospice volunteer and that I would die with veterans because I am a veteran and because I understand the nature of a veteran. And that I, God, the difference I could make is my knowledge of the afterlife. So I became a hospice volunteer. I've been a hospice volunteer for 48 years, no, 46 years. I have more than 34,000 hours at the bedside in veterans going from this world to the next. And like you said earlier, I've been with, I've been with 2013 going from this world to the next and 357 taking their last breath. So when I have to face the panoramic life review, what I get to look at as often as the mistakes I made is the difference that me and God made at the bedside of dying veterans. Now, I don't know if you people listening to me are getting what I'm telling you, but what I'm telling you is how it works and how the divine feminine is already there on that kind, loving, compassionate level. It is already there. You're already there. How do you put that into the spiritual power of being a divine force and making a difference in the world you live in, okay? And your world grows 10 times faster and expounds 10 times quicker. So nobody ever dies, Elizabeth. It's a big joke. And here's the secret. When you come here, you are chosen and you chose to come. It's more important that you were chosen to be here than it is that you chose. That means that the divine force who does the cho choosing about who comes into this plane of existence, which affects six other planes of existence, equal to how you're affecting the one you're in. So when you come here, 
you accept the big lie. And here's the big lie. In the divine world, there is no such thing as loneliness. And there is no such thing as helplessness. They, that does not exist. So you have to come here being helpless and being alone and hold the divine essence of the truth. To be able to be, what is the meaning of life? To practice being a God. Because what are you supposed to do between now and when God gets back? Cover the ground. Do the things that are supposed to be done or do the things that the consciousness or the Christ or the teachings would tell you to do until it gets back. Instead of wait for it, be afraid of dying, if you're going to go to hell, if you're going to go to heaven. All that stuff is just nonsense. It's just complete absurd nonsense. So if you're not going to die, and you were divinely chosen to be here because everybody wants to be us, Elizabeth. Think about it. All the so-called 28 uh, species that study us and all that exotic stuff that everybody says. Think about it. What is it that's so uniquely magical about we, this created so-called species? What is it that makes them all want to be us? Because what the, I already know the answer to that. Okay. I already know that answer. But when you stop to think about what are they all doing here, why they're all trying to help us, why they're all trying to hinder us, why they're all trying to drink our blood, why they're all trying to do all of those things, who does that make us? Well, let's ask that? our audience, what do you think? Why do you think we've got? Uh, 28 extraterrestrial species studying us. <laughs> and why do you think it's so special to be here? So, so, so go ahead and share your uh, what you feel in the chat. I think it'll be interesting to hear um, from our listeners. We have souls, Linda says. Um, you always have a soul. That has nothing to do, the soul consciousness has nothing to do with anything I'm talking about. Okay, the the soul is an essence. It's an essence that never leaves the divine. How about this? The, per, the person to get it right, and I don't know the answer because only Daniel knows the answer. The first person to get it right gets this little truck you can give to a child. <laughs> so we'll just, uh, we'll, we'll keep this running. Um, because we have emotions, goddesses in training, we accept the lie. Once you hear the right one, Daniel, we can we can talk about that one. But I want to move on. Um, and I want to ask you, you've sat at the bedside of 2,000 dying people, and you've been you know, with over 300 who have taken their last breath. What can you tell us um, about death from those experiences um, that, you know, like what is one of the main things that you see people experience give us give us a message of hope with that it's easy a person in transition needs three things they need to know that their life had meaning i mean don't tell them a lot but find something that that happened between you and them that either transformed your life try to find something good but it could be for bad but it's still a part of that their life had meaning and it was important second they need the awareness that they are in transition and you use phrases like, have you gotten everything that you ever needed done, done? Is anybody you think you need to talk to? Because that opens up the conversation where they can talk about that they know that they're in transition. Again, nobody dies. But being that one third of the population of the United States are baby boomers. And there's a generation just before us. That's 73 million people, 72.3 million people. And we're in transition. So the whole nature of reality, Elizabeth, and how you control the species of a spiritual being in human form is you make it feel grief, bereavement, and despair. It comes in the recognition of helplessness and the recognition of being alone. These two psychologies are your controlling connective levels between the ethereal self and the physical, emotional mental self okay the mental the emotional self is a process of the mental self 
It has nothing to do with your divine essence. And it's still separated from your soul. Remember, your soul never goes anywhere. You have never left heaven. You have never disconnected. So the part of you that comes into this level of consciousness has limited vision, limited smell, limited space, limited movement, completely constricted and filled with the big lie, helplessness and loneliness. Because if you can drive helplessness and loneliness, you can control a population using the word despair. And now we have veterans killing themselves every day. We have children committing suicide. And, and think about, I'm thinking about me being cyber bullied. <laughs> That's the funniest thing I ever heard. You think you're going to cyber bully me? Oh, please. But people killing themselves. And when you look at the ratios of teenagers between 12 and 13, and you look at them by, by race, and what you see is frightening. What you see is frightening. It tells us two things. We are where we are. We are birthing the nation. And second, we're not doing enough to hold our ground and prepare and help others deal with it. So that right, I think hearts, we can all agree mm -hmm, so that, that there needs to be, excuse me. Is there something else? Well, you make a really good point, Danyan, because um, with all of the social media and the internet right now, it's actually making people lonelier and especially our youth. Um, our youth who like back, you know, when I was younger, the only option that you had was to play with somebody, you know, um, to meet them in person. There was no option to connect to thousands of people online everywhere where you don't really have the, you know, the one on one interactions, but you're also exposed to a lot more. And as we're moving into this new world, one of the biggest things that we're all called to do and it's really up to each and every one of us to initiate this, but it's to create create sacred spaces where we can get the nourishment and connection that we really need. So um, I'm sure there's a lot of people on this um, call and a lot of people that are going to hear this. And this is where we're at. So Daniel created the Twilight Brigade, which you know he saw a need for veterans who were dying. And because of his experience with death and being a veteran, he created this program. And, you know, I've known Daniel for a long time now. And Daniel, Daniel basically lived with us during the pandemic. Um, and he is always going to a hospital and sitting by the bedside of a veteran. And he's available by phone for that. And so I've watched him do this. So he's definitely walking the talk when it comes to the service, the making so, the world a better place in the way that he was specifically called to in his death experience. Go ahead, Daniel. So let's say the final part to it, Elizabeth. What I'm trying to get across to people is, look, if God didn't come today and God sent you, in the life you just reviewed, what difference did you and God make? That's the perfect starting place. What you'll realize is you're still doing the same thing. Everybody's going to be a hospice volunteer. Everybody. OK, and you're already doing what I'm describing. You just haven't framed it the way I'm saying it. you're kind and loving and caring. You're seeking a sacred tradition that, you know, inwardly must honor you because you are a divine feminine at this particular time, at this place in the transformation and the energetic patterns that are flowing through you are truly being felt by you. OK, so. In hospice work or caregiving work or CMA work or this, this is where you find balance and power because you're, everybody's gonna, everybody is going to need to know their life had value. Okay, now this works across the spectrum, but it's about people in transition. And second, they need to be aware of where they are. You know, don't tell mama she's dying. Well, you think she doesn't know that? Okay, they need to be aware of where they are. By, is there anything that hasn't gotten done? You know, is there anything else you need to do? Anybody you think you need to talk to? That opens up the doorway for them to be able to talk to you. And then third, 
they need permission. They need to know that you're going to be okay. It's important. People don't realize this because we all get caught up in all that religious institution and governmental crap that we're told about thinking somebody's going to die and thinking that you're not going to see them again and thinking about they're going to disappear. That's all craziness. That's all craziness. And we cannot allow that to control us as spiritual beings. What did the pandemic do? It created helplessness and loneliness, which drove despair, which we're only just now trying to find our way out of, of the emotional and ethereal nature of being separated from each other causes. And why I wanted to do Sunday afternoon with Elizabeth is because these times are are needed. And people need a place to, to bounce their life off of. And death is the best place to bounce your life off of to figure out what it's value. What's your value? Okay, when you look at it from that point, you see things about yourself that you don't normally see because you're worried about what somebody else is thinking about you or what someone else's opinion is not being honored. Okay. You learn all of this stuff from watching what family members do in transition and watching how they interact with each other and how they deal with the grief, bereavement, and loss process. I'd like to do, a. Uh, I think that the divine feminine, which is the 37% of all women will be, will be the primary caregiver for one or more parents. Right. 37% of every female on here is going to be that or has already been that. Well, there is where the divine power would need you most, where helplessness and loneliness can be filled or have a job description of your caring work that reaches out to be a part of a listener, where a person that it could be helpless or lonely to be able to be a place for them to come. And I know some people will drive you crazy, but there is a place that the divine would ask of all of us to be heard, but to also listen. I mean, when you have probably 46 years of studying transition, think of this, everybody. I've been a hospice volunteer for 46 years. And I have been through four of these experiences to see what happens after you don't breathe anymore or when you're on breathing tubes, when you're on ventil ventilators, okay? And, you know, when your heart starts beating, they have to beat, pump your blood and beat your heart while they do open heart surgery. And this last one was an aneurysm because my heart was so weakened from being struck by lightning that it, uh, like the, what the doctor said, if you could see the scar tissue on the inside of me, you would never believe what I look like on the outside. But if I look half as bad on the inside as I look on the outside, it's sad. <laughs> it's sad. <laughs> so, so my point is this. If we're going to hold a light in this age, we know we're not going to die. And we know that we accept the big lie that you can be helpless and alone and we still practice being a God or we still use the prowess of the divine feminine to be of service and caring, to be able to listen. That affects the, and what, I'm going to say it, that affects the power of how the divine uses that energy in the other six levels of existence that you are occupying as you listen to my voice, you are living in seven levels of consciousness, this one, and you're living in six others. And we are those anchors. We are the divine spiritual beings that come here, great, powerful, and mighty spiritual beings with dignity, direction, and purpose, always. We come here and believe that you can be helpless and alone in this life and helpless and alone in the next life. And the people who go to the next life abandon us to leave us here alone. This is, the, this is the lesson of a hospice for 45 years or 46 years, everybody. This is what it teaches us. So now, once you know that, 
then being a part of this program with Elizabeth is a smart move because it's a moment to hone the skill. It's the, home, mo the moment where you unite in knowing in a prayer or a sacred ceremony or a tradition that opens and closes so that the divine can hear you and the divine can feel you and the divine can move through you in a program just like this. And if caregiving is a part of that and understanding how the caregiver works from an anal retentive hospice guy who's been dead, who decided that if God couldn't come today, what and, and God sent me in the life I just reviewed, what difference did me and God make? Well, let me give you a secret, everybody. When I'm holding that veteran and I'm looking in their eyes and I'm seeing what they're looking up at, me, and I see that family, and I'm, I'm holding that all together. I'm holding it all together, what they're going through, and I'm making sure that this veteran is leaving this world in safety, and that the way he leaves this world is the, the, the way of a master. I know how you do it, right? Three more That's times. I have been that veteran looking up in the eyes of the divine. I have seen myself for who we really are when we really go home and we really have the life of you and we really quit fooling ourselves with being this with this human nonsense. Okay, this is nonsense. We are great, powerful, and mighty spiritual beings with dignity, direction, and purpose. Never forget that because that's who you are. And when you look at it, there's only one thing that can ever go wrong. You allow something to skew your direction which will affect your dignity and your purpose. And so what is that one thing that's skewing your direction? What have you allowed to get in your way? It's not accepting that you are the divine flow within the sacred nature of the evolution in this consciousness. It is not the male that is the power. That's an illusion. It is the feminine nature, why they call God, guy or a mother in nature it is the feminine power that controls and rules all of this none of this could happen i mean the divine nature of what you call fertilization but none of it could happen if it wasn't for the nature of the divine feminine okay i know this because when you come back from that experience and you sense the nature of it, what that level of consciousness is. And I have seen four levels of those of this place. You know, uh, the old the old Bible say that there are seven heavens. Well, I could say there's four without any question. And each of them were different teachers. But when you get here, everybody, if you accept the things that I'm telling you and you put them as a part of your ritual, I am this then you get two things. You get the divine's ability to have a pathway to prove that you are that. Or you also have a pathway to prove that you're not. <laughs> you know, you either are who I say you are or you're not. Well, I can't wait for somebody to prove me wrong. I just can't wait for it, okay? So the joy of all of this is this. I am so thankful that every one of you are here. And I'm thankful for your appreciation and I'm thankful for your focus. And I'm thankful because you turn into Elizabeth to look at balance and to bring back those ancient traditions that are not filled, you know, that are not filled with all the electronic illusion, deception that is controlling what's happening around us. So I'm thankful. So that's enough of that ranting. What do you want to talk about now, Elizabeth? Thank Love you, you everybody. Danny. There's a there's a few really great points in there. And something I want to just double click on is what I heard you say is that one of the main things that you've uh, been shown from sitting at the bedside with all of these people and also from your own death experiences is that when we open ourselves up to be a conduit of service to help others, the, the power of the divine and the sacred feminine, that compassionate heart, that, that nourishing and that care flows through us. 
And in that way, helps to give our life meaning, but also helps to keep us here on the planet as if we're useful, right? Being useful. As and long as you're um, breathing, as long as you're breathing, as long as you're breathing in and then breathing out, you are useful. The divine, people don't get it, Elizabeth. If you look at air as God, the first thing you have to pay attention is how deep are you breathing? And why do you pay attention how deep you're breathing? Is because the body needs oxygen and the brain needs oxygen. And 20% of your breath of the air you breathe is oxygen and the rest of it is basically nitrogen. So the deeper you are breathing, if it was God, the deeper you are breathing, the more powerful you're becoming because you get more oxygen to your brain. So in order to maximize it in the birth of an age, you have to have a tradition or a ritual, a ceremony that allows yourself to open up to what you were describing to the divine feminine. And you practice that slowly and meticulously. Ceremony, you know, like you do it. I mean, I do panoramic life reviews every night. I mean, when I stop for the end of the day, the last thing I do is I go over my life and I look at it. Okay. And that's the tradition to see how bad I usually did. You know, I've been, I've succeeded at a lot of things in this last 73 years, but I've never been nice all day, a whole day. I have never succeeded at, at being nice all day for one day. So I have yet to accomplish that. But when you look at it, when you stop and you look at it, then I am thankful. So the ceremony has to be a tradition. It would have to be focused on your breathing because the divine would use you using the feminine consciousness and the nature of using it as this power stream that divine can come as you breathe in and fill your eight sonus cavities. It has a value that's open to the divine. And in that tradition, thinking and being gratified that you were able to breathe that breath in. That gratitude came that you breathe that breath in, in that space when you stop. You breathe in and you stop and then you breathe out. That it was gratitude for that breath. And then you breathe out with no thought. And the divine feminine's energetic pattern can match to that gratitude based on air as the invisible power and essence of the value of your life and move through you into this place. And you can be around children or grandchildren or be around people who are pricks or, or evil or bad or whatever. And you just use the ritual and tradition and it will reinforce that what I'm telling you is not only right, that my system of understanding, it works. So I see a lot of uh, familiar faces on this call. Some of you have been with me for years and you know that uh, some of you have gone through the priestessing death program, actually. So inside of the mystery school that you know I developed because I, I went out and I needed to find these initiations and ceremonies and wisdom, then I put it all together and then I offer various programs. But I see some of you here that have gone through the, the priestessing death and Daniel, I think it'd be really neat to um, download some of your wisdom on death as well. And maybe we can do a little mini program together or something because this is one of those sacred uh, birthing, those sacred appointments and um, priestesses, high priestesses, shamanesses, shamans, medicine people, they are the ones who were traditionally holding that masterful space um, of, of tending that rebirth into the spirit world. And it's one of the most beautiful ceremonial events that could ever occur birth and death, you know, are the times that the spirit world opens up and receives a soul or delivers one. And women uh, traditionally, because our bodies are the portal for the growth of a being and the, the birth of a being here. And therefore every human being that's ever existed on planet earth has come through the portal of a woman. Um, but look at that, 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 look at that symbolically, watch, move away from it being personalized. Don't personalize us. For a moment, let's not personalize it. Move it away as a, as a symbol that the regeneration and the nature of Gaia, the earth, what the earth does and what this, this system of, of reality, the, 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 the law of nature and the nature of the law within this context. 
the feminine power and the giver of life is symbolic to the whole cycle like we are now in the fall. We are looking at what we're going to harvest. We are looking at our harvest and what we harvest based on the equinox and the astrological viewpoint. We'll see what's going to happen. And then we move into an election year of a critical crisis in an election year where the decisions that we make collectively, individually, will determine the destiny of our country. Will we hold to a certain divine spiritual nature or will we give in to so many things that are showing up? Not all of them are bad, although they seem bad, everybody. But when you're birthing an age, all things are new. All things are new. And no matter what you think, yesterday is gone. At the world that you grew up in, it is gone. It's gone. And you accept that and you look at where we are and we make a plan and we move forward. And why when Beth and I started, I mean, Elizabeth and I were talking about this, death is the best place to start. Because in order to back engineer health care and to put divine consciousness where it's prayers and it's thoughtfulness and it's essence and it's a fragrance that comes with you to be a part of visiting or seeing family members or friends in transition and to know what to do and to how to do it only allows that divine feminine in the sacred breath ritual, in the sacred breath ritual that allows the divine to move through you into that person or into this level of existence. And that's the symbolic nature of the divine feminine. And it comes all the way to where it is, where the species procreates itself and everything fertilizes itself and life is created. (laughs) One of the things um, I wanted to talk about too, Danyan, is uh, giving people some practical ways to navigate uh, the coming changes because we're, tw- you know, 12, 13 years um, into the Mayan calendar. What are we? Uh, the Mayan, I'd like you to talk about that after the Mayan calendar ended. And it is the time of a new earth. It is the time of new structures, but old things are breaking apart and falling away. And and so, um, you know, if you watch the news or if, you wa- if you're on social media a lot, it can be very, um, uh, I-, I guess, depressing maybe because- I discerned powerlessness requires discerning discernment yeah. um and so let's talk about ways practical ways to navigate these coming changes and breath is one of them so breath it's work everything. is uh really becoming popular there's various kinds of breath work one of the most ancient kinds of breath work is literally in qigong practices you're breathing you're moving your body you're, you know, moving in time with the breath. It's a unification. And so Qigong, I have a Qigong program on my website. Um, those of you who follow me know that I do various Qigong stuff throughout the year. Um, but there is one that's always on my website. And then um, breath work, like actually like laying down with the music, breathing really hard, going through the emotions. Um, also, that also releases DMT into your body as well. So you can have transcendent experiences. These are coming back right now. And I feel they're coming back because it's a big tool for us. Um, Because traditionally in shamanic societies, uh, we would work with plant medicines to access the spirit world, but it's not very practical. Um, The the death experience, and I've had two near-death experiences and I've done 70 ayahuasca journeys. It's not really the practical way. It's it's very fringe, if you will. So we needed something for people. And breathwork has really come for that to, to um, transition people into the spirit world. Um, Daniel, breath can you also key. talk about... Um, breath, breath is... If, if we start right there, Elizabeth, if we start there, appreciating our breath and being thankful and gratitude for being able to breathe that breath in. It's by being thankful or structuring gratitude when you breathe the breath in and to hold it, it will move through six levels. It moves. If you want to, let's say that people are trying to contact a relative, okay? 
they want to communicate with someone. Well, you would use the same system. It's just the value that you structure upon the system when you pull it in based on using gratitude. Okay, if I'm breathing in and I'm breathing in and I'm thankful that the air is there, I have gratitude that I have lungs capable of breathing it in. I am thankful that I can hold it and get as much oxygen as I can. And then I can breathe it out to make a difference in the world that I'm living in, in the people I'm trying to help or be. I use it a thousand times at the bedside and no one ever sees it. No one ever sees it or recognizes it, but I gain knowledge about that person that helps me empathically understand about them with not anybody telling me so that I can better help them make the transition from this world to the next. Okay, people call it psychic, empathic, all of that. It comes from listening to the sound of a person's voice. That is your spiritual tone. That tone and frequency in your voice is your spiritual tone. And then you listen to that voice and wait for the verbs. And you listen to what context or that that verb is put in. And, you know, most people don't do this or they're too paying attention to find an answer instead of listening to the points that give you the higher level of perspective. The conjugation of a verb tells you action and intent. So if you have a place of gratitude, you have a breath. And you know the action and intent, which is usually helping people get through crisis, or at least being a sounding board so that they can talk and hear themselves. And people in transition need that really bad. And the people who are in transition or the basic caregiver needs that also. So how you get through what's coming is everything is going to change, everybody, and it's changing now. We're in, a, we're in another war that could be a world war, just like in the boxes of knowledge. It said, if you keep doing the same thing you've always doing, this was 1975 after Vietnam that I got struck by lightning. If you keep doing the same things that you're always doing, you'll end up in wars and then you'll end up in the box 12 and we're a nuclear war where chemical and biological and nuclear war would be present that would come right after there was a pandemic. I saw this in 1975 and when I was quote unquote dead and I wrote it down in 1976 and I put it in Saved by the Light 28 years ago. Anybody can go look at the boxes of knowledge and see there's about 97% accuracy of what they said was going to happen based on that we are great, powerful, and mighty spiritual beings with dignity, direction, and purpose. So if all that crap they showed me was true, and it came true, then you are a great, powerful, and mighty spiritual being and filled with dignity, direction, and purpose. So get over it. Get over all that other stuff that you're going through and thinking about it, and listen to this. If we appreciate a ceremony, mine, I do it three times a day, you know, and I do it like clockwork. I try to do it at 10, 2, and 4. Sometimes I have to do one at seven, but the body hunts sugar at 10, two and four. So when the body's hunting sugar and it's going to find it, it's going to find something that supports your adrenal glands. And that's what it's going to do. And then it's going to hunt trace minerals in order to create enzyme and compound solution reactions so that it benefits the body. This is what the body does. So I look at those time frames to be able to put into position the systems that I'm trying to explain that you automatically and naturally have. I have to train myself to do this. You as a feminine power in the context of this reality are automatically in that space. And, and you have 50 more years of power to use it. Ah, I wish I was you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll try to do our best with what we have and it comes back down to uh the basics you know the basics the breathing. personal ceremony personal breath breathing gratitude breathing in the air breathing in the sunlight um witnessing a sunset witnessing a sunrise enjoying the 
the simple things. And I feel today in this world where there's just so much information and, you know, we can just get caught on social media and lose a couple hours and then have our mind full of so much information. It really, there's really like an energetic um, feeling of emptiness that comes with it. And so I think it's so important that we remember the, these little, simple, timeless ceremonies and put them in our lives. So thank you for uh, reminding us of that, the breath ceremony, doing it at specific times in the day. And Daniel, I, I think um, one of the reasons you're still alive is because of your knowledge of the practicalities of food and minerals. Can you share with us uh, the importance that you feel that minerals have in our physical health? Well, there is no question because we're such close friends, Elizabeth. You know, we're like we lived through the pandemic together. You know my ritual. You know how I am about trace minerals. You know, listen, everybody. I can raise myself from the dead. And what I'm most famous for is being able to do that. Well, you can't do that talking crap. You can't do that waiting for a doctor. Or you can't do that waiting for a caregiver. That's just not going to happen. What you have to do is focus on your breathing. And you have to find a sound and frequency that becomes consistent within the nature of your breathing. I use Stephen Halpern's Spectrum Suite. I know every note and every sound on that piece of music. So I breathe within the rhythm of that of Spectrum Suite. And I use a 528, 80, 92, and 432 frequencies within that framework. I just layered it. I had Stephen layer it in there. Okay, once you use your breathing and you are conscious of the value of your breath, then it's trace minerals. I use trace mineral research. That is not somebody I'm a sponsor of. That's not somebody I'm any of that. What it is is that I have looked at every compound, every trace mineral, every one, they, I've tried them all. Trace mineral research comes from the Great Salt Lake. I mean, that means American made, but it holds and are the best trace minerals. So my basic, without any question, is 20, 20 drops of trace minerals every single day, trace mineral research, get it on Amazon. And I pay attention to breathing exercises. I do those three times a day. I take B-complex time release. The body strips out three, six, and 12 literally instantly. So if you never, if you ever take B complex, then your urine is always yellow because the body can only take so much B. And once it hits that maximum load of three, six, and 12, it passes it off. So you have to have time release. And you have to take that before four o'clock. You cannot not take it anytime you get ready. You take it before four o'clock so that it gives the adrenal glands a break. You always have to think about your adrenal glands, and that's what B-complex does. You need a CoQ10. I mean, you need something that supports the heart. And I use, I use cortisol mushrooms, and I use uh, dandelion root. And I buy it in pill form because how the lungs and how the body converts oxygen into blood cells to be moved through the body into the heart is very important because there's three or four different ways that the body does that. I use uh, cordyceps mushrooms and I use root to be able to get the maximum amount of oxygen out of that breath to get into my bloodstream so that I can affect all this screwed up crap that's on the inside of me. And I like fruits and vegetables. I like them and I don't like them cooked too much. And I, I try to refrain from too much, eating too much meat unless Mel is making barbecue. Okay, but I'm not a big meat eater. I'm a fish eater. Because all I do is measure how long it takes the body to digest it. And based on how long it takes the body to digest it is whether I'm going to eat it or not. It has nothing to do with, and I don't like no waste farming. I don't like, I don't, I will say part of me doesn't eat some of those things 
because it's morally, you know, how we farm, you know, what we do for farming. But one question, ladies asking before, 4 a.m. or 4 p.m.? You meant 4 p.m. 4 p.m. 4 p.m. But how long does it take my system to digest it and get the nutrition out of it? Okay. Uh, beef is probably, depending on how you cook it, it's, it's five to seven days. All right. I don't know if I'm interested in five to seven days. And the average person at 50 years old has 20 pounds of undigested beef in, in their system. So you have to be careful about if you're eating it, when you digest it and cleanse it. So I'm not telling, trying to tell people, Elizabeth, what they should eat, what they not eat. I'm telling them how I can get up from the dead with no chance to live. This is how I do it. And it's not, this is not a theoretical system, everybody. This is a system that I use based on gratitude, putting my feet in the sand, putting my feet in the dirt, realizing, like I always say, the, wor the worst thing that's ever happened to people was electricity because it's been the best for us to move forward in our hearts, minds, and on so many areas of understanding but it also causes us to lose our frequency within the framework of Mother Earth and Gaia and the creative forces of the Schumann Resonance. And when you realize that the Earth has a frequency, 7.82 hertz, you live in an electrical field called air. It has an atmosphere, a stratosphere, and an ionosphere and two subspheres. So you're living in an electrical universe. So what you eat, what you do, what you think, and what you have gratitude for interjects and energizes within the electrical universe. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you are bigger than you think you are. You're more connected than you think you are. You're more powerful than you think you are. And you're definitely far more spiritual than you think you are. And I love each and every one of you. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that um, life extending wisdom, Daniel. And Daniel definitely has it. He uh, he has been on the brink of death for a long time, and he's still with us. And some of you in the comments have mentioned that they've been on the, the path of light course with us. They've they've followed your journey, Daniel, um, and they're happy that you're still here. So, thank you for sharing that because it definitely works. That's really important. Um, we just have a little bit of time left, Daniel, and I want to double click on the star beings. Just so you all know, Daniel and I are both speaking at the Star Knowledge Conference in South Dakota. You can also um, you can show up live if you want to support us in South Dakota. It's November 11th. It's actually the 10th, 11th and 12th. But you can also view it online. So you can go to starknowledge1111.com and you can buy tickets if you want. So um, Daniel and I will be doing that. And I want to double click on the star being thing because I mentioned it in the emails um, just ever so lightly. And um, I def I've had a number of star being um, experiences in my lifetime. And we just had these congressional hearings about star beings. I like star beings better than ETs or aliens, star beings. So our for some reason, our, our own government is phenomenal. deciding that they want to talk about it right now. Um, Daniel, would you like to share anything about star beings? Maybe anything from your personal experience um, right now? Sure. Okay. They don't, don't want to say UFOs because UFOs come from 1947 and Roswell, which is the biggest lie they ever told, you know. So now they call it unidentified aerial phenomena. They got a new name hoping for everybody to forget that there's UFOs. All right. So I have watched this from a point of, of it was always... It was always, and mine it goes back to the Maya, the Egyptians, the Inca, the Mulche. You, you know, most people don't realize that I have gone to 94 countries, and a lot of those countries I was looking up traditions of 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 deaths, deaths, anthropological thanatology, looking up death cults. In the course of it, 
extraterrestrial interactions always appear as a value of whether we are alone or not. Well, I can tell you without any question, we're not alone. Okay, not only are they having to admit to it now because of the, all the pressure that everybody puts on them, they have to rename the phenomena so that it's brand new information. Okay, it's now an unidentified aerial phenomena, not a UFO, but a, a, a ADP, you know, so or whatever they're calling it. When you birth an age, and you're part of something that is a cycle that is that is universally happening. If people who look at NASA.com are, are a big uh, a big obsessive compulsive information gatherers like myself, you know, I, I used to say I have so much worthless, I have so much worthless trivia. But when you look at the fact that the planets are shifting, Neptune and, and Mars, Venus. There are energetic patterns. They're watching things happen on these planets and they're listening to the change of the music the universe sings. Do you realize on NASA, you can go on the NASA website and you can listen to the recorded sounds that the uh, Explorer satellite is now going a billion miles, sending back transmissions of the universe singing. <laughs> Think about it. The universe sings and it's recorded on NASA lives. So when people start to think that we are not as expansive and as magnificent and as connected and as starborn, then it is you're being ungracious to yourself. You're not appreciating the fact that they all want to be us, everybody. We are that we have a what's called the the divine spark. I call it the God spark. We have a certain nature in us that they all want to experience. They all want to be a part of what it is that we are and how, how we limited ourselves to come into a physical form with, with rules that are lies, that we can be helpless and that we can be alone. And to be able to do that, to be helpless and alone, and to hold a certain spiritual value of kindness, love, support, compassion, and what everything motherhood represents and the divine feminine represents and to hold that empowers the force or the nature of the divine to, to spiritually affect six other levels other than us spiritually affecting the one we're living in. All this was shown to me in 1975. I wrote about it in Saved by the Light. Nothing's ever carved in stone. So why I wanted to come together with Elizabeth on this Sunday afternoon is to bring a few more of us closer to that warmth and fire that is the spiritual nature of what's happening, bring us a little closer to the divinity of ourselves, and to learn that that breath that you're taking during this program is based on me setting my prayers of the value of my breath and my words, I can use your breath to convert it into an energy to help whoever wins the prize of these children's toys, changes the lives. This is a physical form, everybody. In a physical world, when there's a physical transaction, then you have grounded the nature of the power of the essence of the reason why you're giving it. So while when whoever gets these today, they with a certain prayer or an intention that we collectively set, that we collectively set, it goes with that. And we've made a difference in the life of a child as we've come together today. And I am thankful. Beautiful, Daniel. Um, with, so with that, I'd like to transition into our gift giving. And um, this is just, these toys are made from a place called the Happy Factory in Utah. And it's such an amazing giveaway business. It's all volunteer. Uh, again, th these are uh, reclaimed wood pieces from cabinetry and whatnot. And when we, when we were there, I was just there this weekend, oiling these cars with my mom and the Lions Club. And they took me in the back and there was a 92 year old veteran in the back, cutting these 
cars. Um, so it, this is a beautiful company. And again, I've got a box of probably maybe 70 of these. And my intention is that I definitely want them to go to children, um, children in need uh, so that it can bless a child with happiness. Um, so that's the intention. And I hope that the winners of these do the same. And also, if any of you know, um, I would love, I live in Sedona. If there are any um, children's organizations, I would love to, I would love to personally deliver these to children in hospitals. That would be like my dream um, to just see the joy on children's faces. So if anyone knows of anything like that, go ahead and um, email us. So um, this car here, I think that, Daniel, I think you just gave the answer to that question that you had posed earlier, why we are the ones that are looked at by 28 different species. Is that correct? Absolutely. You just gave the answer. And so there's somebody in the chat who I think got it right. Um, Altazar said, it's because we are source connected and we're transitioning interdimensionally through the physical body. And we are going to show the rest of the universe the way because it hasn't been done before. Well, in six levels. In six okay. levels. That, that might, we'll add, that, we'll add the six levels. Every, everything they said was true, okay? And Elizabeth, it may be more, and I'm probably sure it's more. It's just that I can say categorically seven. The one we're in right now, and six others. It's going to do that. We are. We have that God spark, and everybody wants to feel it, be it, express it, hold it. Okay, because we, we, are helpless and alone, and we hold and keep the light lit. <laughs> so whoever so gets this, thank you. God spark. And I would not give it to anybody. I'd put it on a shelf. If I, when you get it, I'd put it on the shelf. And every time I look at it, I would use my breathing exercise and the power and the nature of everyone who was on this prayer group, this session today, and that you call and send your blessings to them. And then you use that as the focus of your ceremony. And, and you take each and every one of us who's on this with you as you do it. So, yep, you can also do that with this car. So I say that Altazar, um, you got it the closest. So send us your address. We'll send this to you. We have one more. And so this is going to be the pop quiz. Um, so the pop quiz is how many books worldwide did Banyan's book Saved by the Light sell? How many of these were sold worldwide? The first one to answer correctly wins. The wooden so, truck. So let's go see. Oh, very good. All right. You guys were listening. Colleen Taylor is the first one to write it in. So Colleen, Hello. congratulations. There's a few people um, got that right. Colleen's the first one. Send us your address and we'll send you a wooden truck from Happy Factory. And they are blessed with the energy of this call, everything we've talked about, all the love from Daniel and I and all these beautiful souls that are here with us. Uh, we're so happy that you could gather with us and share your love. I just invite you to look at the gallery view. Um, look at all the beautiful souls here and just take in all these beautiful faces. Thank you all. Thank you, Mel Minotaur for helping with the technology. Um, Everyone be sure to follow Danyan's Facebook page. Look Danyan Brinkley up on Facebook. Um, we put it in the chat, but follow Danyan. Danyan is a, a wealth of information. Um, so invite you to do that. Beautiful to see everyone's faces. Um, again, Danyan and I are doing the Star Knowledge Conference, starknowledge1111.com. We're doing that together. And he's writing his book. I'm writing my book. I also have a program on angels coming up. So my, my priestess path program this year, and it's going to be available for men as well, is all about connecting to our angelic guides and beings um, for 
real life, real time blessings and healing and power and carrying that into the next world as well. So that's the next thing that I'm doing. And we also have a priestess retreat coming up in March in Sedona. So those are the things that are on the plate for those of you that wish to continue to participate. Um, and, you know, as you know, I always do free webinars every now and then as spirit calls. And so I hope that you can join us again on one of those. Dan, and Elizabeth, you like light streamers. You can, everybody can find me on lightstreamers.com. Mel has taken all my stuff and put it on lightstreamers.com. So beautiful if you name, want to follow so where I am can be connected with lightstreamers.com. And Daniel's pretty active on Facebook. So Daniel's Facebook page there. Um, I invite you all to uh, connect with me on Instagram because I have Instagram impersonators. So connect to the real Elizabeth Seraphine. Um, go to Instagram. And the spelling of my last name now is S-E-R-A-P-H-I-N-E. And um, I'll have 7,000-ish followers if I have an ins if I have an impersonator, they they won't have as many. So make sure you friend me. We're dealing with that um, anyway. Well, great. I hope that you have gotten something out of this, something that you can take with you, something that you can um, incorporate into your your daily life, your daily routine, an expansive vision of ourselves as eternal souls on an eternal timeline. Um, in a big world with star beings as brothers and sisters and co-creators, and also down to our personal habits, you know, what we do with our daily life, how that can empower us, um, and also how that can open us up to being a vessel for the power of the divine to move through, through us to help other people. And that's what the Priestess Path Lineages of Light Temple is all about. It's about being that blessing and being that vessel. So um, I invite anybody who wishes to go deeper, to go deeper. Thank you for all of you who are on this call, who have been with me for years and have been in the temple. And I hope to see some of you in person at the Priestess Retreat in Sedona. And Danyan, thank you so much uh, for doing this. It's always such a blessing and so fun to share time with you. And I hope that we can do it again. I look forward to it. And Elizabeth, I'm very, very proud of you. And I and everybody on this, I love you with all my heart. And I'm thankful that you've chosen to find a ritual tradition of the feminine power and to use it and to manifest it every single day. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Until next time, take care. Blessings to you and your family.